Courtney Pine presents. Lisa Torbock finds the simplest of expressions baffling. If I were to put money on where the phrase back to square one comes from, I'd have said it was this. The curry's hot. That's a bit scary. Debate about the word hotter still. Mm. Tazine Airmed gets to the bottom of the Balti. Felipe Fernandez Armesto has a bee in his bonnet about clever chaps. I'm going to that island over there on the trail of the first ever boffins. While I've been mugging up on bingo lingo. Both sixes, click, click, click. So, the letter B, bring it on. The English language is full of wonderfully evocative phrases like the birds and the bees or butter wouldn't melt. And then there are those which sound terribly logical, like back to square one. This turned out to be one of the most popular phrases in our word hunt. Perhaps people were outraged that the OED didn't have written evidence of back to square one from before 1960. Actress, presenter and crossword fanatic Lisa Tarbuck set off on the trail of a phrase whose origins are close to home. If you could only take one of those eight records with you, which one would you take? Oh, me or Bambino Carl. Back to square one. I like this expression. It's a good, stout sort of a phrase. To me, it implies that you've had a go, you've explored a particular avenue, it hasn't worked out, and you've had to go back to the beginning and re-look at your situation. Apparently, it's only been around since 1960, whereas to me, it feels as old as the hills. <laughs> Word hunters wrote to tell us there was no mystery about the phrase's origin. It was the BBC. Could you join us at the FA Cup final? And by Jove, what an exciting match this is. And Howard's running up the field with the ball. He's moving through square three. Promising move. He passes to Brown. That's in square four. A good pass, sir. And he's moving... You were adamant pass. this is what happened. Carter in square five. The move comes to naught, and the ball to goalkeeper Smith. Back to square one. But what evidence is there for this theory? I met up with a sports historian. You are telling me that back to square one starts with a football game. I am indeed. Actually, a rugby game. OK. The, the very first broadcast of a, a rugby match or any sports event in this country. It was January the 15th, 1927, and the corporation is only a couple of weeks old, and obviously they're looking for gimmicks and ideas to try and broaden their appeal. A grid was published in the Radio Times to give listeners a chance to follow the commentary on football matches and rugby matches that were broadcast on the BBC. The eyewitness uh, was literally in a very small shed um, built into the side of the, of the ground. And as he commentated, a man sitting next to him would call out the name of the square in which the play was situated at that particular moment. And now I get to hear these fellas. I do indeed. May I say that this is the first broadcast running commentary on any sport been given in this country. Don't get your square pen, the Radio Times. Well taken yet. He's kicking to the left. Well okay. defending the south end now. Square two. Say it more square two. Ah. Thank you, Charlie. He's kicking the touch towards the right. So will I ever hear the famous phrase? No. Well defending the south end now. Square there, two. there he goes. He's kicked back and hard touch just about the halfway line. Wales is ball. Harding's throwing it in. Fairly long one. England have it. I think it's Square Tucker. They never actually say back to square anything, and looking at it, square one isn't any more special than square eight. This is why I've got a problem with it. How much play actually takes place in square one? And then what about changing ends? It doesn't really hold water for me. Have you ever heard them say back to square one? Ah, uh, but that's not the point. It's what <laughs> the listeners interpreted 
That's how it enters the parlance. Simon's confidence is not backed up by hard evidence. I just don't buy it. The second lead we got from the word hunt traced the phrase back to a childhood game. It also has a square one. You remember? Hopscotch. You hop up and down the squares, avoiding your stone. But do the rules send you back to square one? I found a hopscotch ologist. It's true you have to hop along and go back again to square one. Yeah. But if you miss the square when you're throwing the stone, you don't go back to square one at that point. You're out and you go to the back of the line and start again from where you started. When you read about hopscotch in the books and you're looking for the rules, there is no reference to going back to square one. And the kids couldn't help either. Now, can I just see your tongue? Do you think I'm going to believe a woman with a blue tongue? <laughs> Well, it's inconclusive, isn't it? There's no hard and fast rules for going back to square one in hopscotch. So where does that leave us? Another theory suggested by word hunters sounds more promising. This is what I was looking for. If I were to put money on the origins of back to square one, I really would have to say it was snakes and ladders. But I don't know the ins and outs, and I don't know what came before this game, because there must be something. And yes, there are experts in this too. Time to meet a man with one of Britain's biggest collections of board games. We have here a Snakes and Ladders, but it's not like anything I've ever seen before. No, this is what you might call a real Snakes and Ladders, like real ale or real tennis. This is, in fact, an example of the first commercial British version of Snakes and Ladders. It was made in the form of a spiral, so it's kind of familiar when you look carefully. Ooh, nearly knocked myself off. Oh, see ya. OK, so this is oh, an I example say. of a 19th century hand-painted Indian board for Snakes and Ladders. You've got very dangerous-looking snakes. But the point was, it was used to teach children the basic difference in life between good behaviour and bad behaviour and what happens to you if you're naughty. What's this one? Well, this is an example of an, another early English board, not a round one like we saw before, but one where the original Indian idea is still visible. If you have a good look at these small drawings, you will see that virtue here is rewarded and wickedness punished. Uh, pinching cookies out of the jar is a highness crying and down you go. Is there anything in board games that directly refers to, to square one? When you say back to square one, everybody thinks, oh, it must be snakes and ladders. But when you play snakes and ladders, if you have bad luck or you're naughty, you go down the snakes, sometimes right from up to the top, right from near the bottom, but you never go back to square one. Well, none of the snakes actually went back to square one. But I can't help thinking that this really is our answer. There's just no proof. Back to square one. There's no hard evidence for any of these theories. But then a word hunter sent us this. It's a review of a book in a learned journal which says the reader is being always sent back to square one in a sort of intellectual game of snakes and ladders. Not only does this back up my favourite theory, but it's from 1952, eight whole years before the dictionary's current entry. Let's see what those clever folk at the OED make of that. So 
far this series, we've added to the dictionary 17 times. But this time, I'm keener they take something out. Their current entry mentions both board games and the Radio Times grid. So, the sound archives have been checked. There is no evidence that anybody ever said back to square one in a football commentary. Is it not just a bit of urban myth that shouldn't be in the dictionary? Well, no evidence. It's very hard to prove a negative. Um, I suppose the obvious thing is um, just because you didn't find any evidence, it doesn't mean to say nobody ever said it. It's quite suggestive, though. I think if there's no evidence to be found in the sound archives, then that's a whole area that we know is devoid of evidence. But that puts the burden of proof in an interesting place. I mean, I might just as well say if there's no positive evidence, it shouldn't be there. I think one of the reasons that, that we do mention this theory is um, because we have so many people writing into us all the time to say this is the origin of the phrase. So don't tell us. We know already that this is alleged to be where it comes from. I think, to be fair, we, we could be um, stronger and clearer in our wording that, that we are mentioning this because it's in circulation and not because we believe it. And I mean, we could say more strongly that we don't believe it. Well, while you're making changes, let me offer you an antedating. 1960 is your earliest citation. We've got one here, 1952. And it mentions back to square one in a game of snakes and ladders. Ah. Uh, now, that's quite nice because we do say the phrase may simply come from a board game such as snakes and ladders. John, is it time to take out that slightly dodgy definition of the football and to put in this new date? Well, what I think we should do is to uh, downgrade the Association Football Commentary Sense and maybe upgrade the game suggestion. As far as the quotation is concerned, 1952, I believe. Um, back to square one, it's a great quotation. It's eight years earlier than what we already have, and it's the right sense. There's no doubt it goes in. 1-0. We've jumped forward two squares. We all know the bomber jacket is based on the cool dude American flying jacket from World War II. But surprisingly, the dictionary couldn't find the phrase bomber jacket before 1973 and suggested it might be 70s retro styling. Word hunters were having none of it and blitzed us with earlier evidence. The best? An ad in the Los Angeles Times from 1940. So we've beaten the dictionary by 33 years. Well done, word hunters. Mission accomplished. once said, I like traditional English food, like pasta. A more genuine British dish is chicken tikka masala. Sounds like something from the Indian subcontinent actually invented here. But what about balti? It's a big part of British life, and its name recently entered the OED. But where does the word come from? Journalist Tazine Airmed went back to her roots in Birmingham to find out. English is chocker with words adopted from South Asia. We started with trade and inherited words like chintz from Hindi, pajamas from Urdu, and calico from Calcutta. Nowadays, it seems the food is the international language, so it should come as no surprise that the latest addition to the dictionary is the word bolting. A style of cooking influenced by the cuisine of northern Pakistan, comprising highly spiced dishes usually served in wide, round-bottomed metal pans.
The dictionary has a hunch, but isn't certain when and where the Balti first appeared. The word was apparently first applied to restaurants in the area of Birmingham in the early 1980s, although printed evidence for this has not been found. Birmingham on the brink of the 80s. Even Kojak is singing the city's praises. This is my kind of town. Birmingham's road systems are revolutionary. The modern buildings reflect its position as the nation's industrial powerhouse. You feel as if you've been projected into the 21st century. But though Kojak clocked the curry house, he didn't find the Balti. It was left to us to research Brum's culinary heritage and appeal to its citizens for help. In the area known as the Balti Triangle, two rival restaurateurs claim to have invented it. The contenders, Mr. Ajaib of Al Faisal's and Mr. Butt of Imran's. I start Balti in 1980. I'm the man who created the Balti in the United Kingdom, the first Balti house in the United Kingdom in Birmingham. This actual style of cooking, what was it called in Pakistan? When you go in Pakistan, they're cooking in the big karai, you know, chop it and cook from there, you know. Right. And I like to put the names karai. So why did you decide to change the name from karai to Balti? The song is a nice Balti instead of karai, you know. The thing is, can you actually prove it? Have you got a menu that shows us that, or a photograph of that course, time? Of course, of uh, course, I have uh, some menu upstairs. Can you show them to us now? I can prove you, yes, yes. No you problem. think for, you can prove it from no. 1980? Yes, of course. Mr Ajayev sent his staff to fetch the promised proof. Yeah, big book. Do you know when this was done, roughly? Long time ago. Long time ago. Do you know when? Do you know when? I think she's only 1881, you know. But there's no, you've got no proof of that. No, no date. So hundreds of photographs, but crucially, no date. Can Imran's around the corner do any better? Quite a few other restaurants are saying that they were the first ones to come up with the Balti. That's right, yeah. yeah. Because they follow us first. But you you know, say you came first. Exactly, yeah. You know, the 1973 or something, 74, my brother went to the Balti, and then a um, lot of people, they make the name of Balti. But can you actually prove it? Do you have any menus or any photographs that would prove when you actually first made it? Well, that's the problem, because now, because you're asking, and we keep all paperwork now, because we don't know after a few now it's years. Too late. Yeah, now <laughs> too late. That's right. You're 100% right. There must be something written down. library now for hours looking through the phone directories and found nothing looked through the Birmingham Post found nothing but I have made a very exciting discovery I found something called the Balsall Heathen which is uh, a local area in Birmingham and this is a newspaper for that area and in July 1982's edition I've been looking from the 1970s up until 1982 and I found an advert for um, an Indian restaurant and there for the very first time is the word Balti that's two whole years before the Oxford English Dictionary. Well, that Ambala's is long gone, but we now know the Balti was in Birmingham as far back as 1982. But how did it get its name? We use a Tamil word curry to describe all sorts of similar dishes. Their names have come from many sources. 
Take the fiery vindaloo. That's perhaps from Portuguese, vinho and alho, wine and garlic. But balti in my mother tongue is far from appetizing. Balti, or balti as it is in Urdu, is basically one of these, a bucket. Now, before I came to Birmingham, I'd never had a balti before. I've lived in Pakistan, I've never seen it on the menus. My mum has never cooked me a balti at home either. So what I want to know is what on earth this idea of a balti is all about. We weren't short of word hunters who were convinced by the bucket theory. But now I've been invited to meet a local businessman with a new suggestion. It doesn't look that promising though, does it? Oh my goodness, look at this place. Hello? Look, there's a balti bucket. Originally from the Punjab, Tara Singh came to England in 1960 and he's been making kitchenware ever since. When was the first time you actually heard the word balti? A man came to me from Derby. He said, can you make me some Baltis? I said, what is a Balti? I don't make any Baltis. I said, Balti is a bucket. You can buy the buckets from the shop. So I showed him one of my karais. He said, that's what I want. He says, in the restaurant business, everybody calls them Baltis. I don't know who brought this name out, but I started wondering about it. Then I, when I looked at my younger days in the villages in India, my mom and my sisters used to, to serve us some food to, to the boys or girls, uh, which was called Bati. Bati. Bati, B-A-T-I. Bati is a Punjabi name. And bati is exactly if you have a omelet pan, not a not a fry pan, omelet pan without a handle, and that's a bati. So we've got a new lead on where the word balti comes from. It could come from the Punjabi word bati, which means shallow dish. Now that certainly sounds a lot more plausible than a plastic bucket. But do scholars recognize this word? Yes, it's pronounced bati. Bati, okay. Yeah. What does it mean? Uh, bati is used to refer to any kind of pots and pans, you know, used in the kitchen. It's a generic term, uh, not very specific. So does that mean that bati could have become balti? That is a very interesting question. Uh, I'm a little bit a skeptic about it, but as a linguist, I'll have to accept that it's plausible. So, Barty is a possible origin for Balti and a new theory to take to the OED. I'm proud that Birmingham's Asian community has given the dictionary a new word. It won't be the last, so what's next? My tip, watch out for Fendu. Will our balti theory curry favour with the Oxford hotshots? Or will they say it's potty and pan it? At least our earlier evidence should fit the bill. Let's roll back the years with the help of that august publication, The Heathen, Balsall Heath's local newspaper. What they've got here is an advert for a restaurant selling Balti meats, 1982. And we actually checked that same restaurant's previous adverts in the newspaper, and that's the first time they advertised Balti. So it's a real deliberate change at a certain point in time. Interesting. And just the sort of publication that we can't send the average researcher out to go and look for. Looks good. So, Tanya, what do you make of this Barty theory? Well, it's an interesting one. The theory that the name of a dish could come from 
literally the dish it was cooked in. It, it's, it's a pattern we know that words follow. Even in English, a word like casserole does that. So, so that's great. Um, it's a word from the right part of the world, um, Punjabi. Wor that works. Um, the form of the word worries me slightly. Um, I'm not entirely sure how you get from Barty, I'm sure I don't pronounce it right, to, to Balti. Um, the appearance, the sudden appearance in the middle of a word of a sound, as if from nowhere, is potentially a problem. I think it's certainly worth further investigation. John, it's a possible new derivation and definitely a new date. What do you say? Yeah, it's a possible new derivation and, as far as the quotation is concerned, from the heathen, um, just a sort of local uh, reference we'd like to have found ourselves. So it's great. Thanks very much for finding it for us. And, yeah, that one's certainly in. Fantastic news. Thank you very much. Clickety-click, Kelly's eye, to players up and down the country, bingo is little short of a religion, and these are its incantations. But why did the game develop its own lingo, and does that still play a part today? I like a bit of a flutter, I went to find out. Bingo, bingo, I'm in love. Kelly's eye, I'm her guy, and she's my number one. Number three, up a tree, she's got me on the run. Number five, man alive. People have been playing bingo for years, but it used to be known by a host of other names. The most common were Lotto, Kino, Tombola, House and Housey Housey. So why did it become bingo? bingo! From its early origins in Renaissance Italy as a state-run lottery game, Lotto advanced across Europe in different forms. It was used to teach children maths. It was played by sailors bored at sea. But the word bingo meant something entirely different. Excuse me, could I get a large bingo, please? The earliest meaning of bingo was brandy. A dictionary of Kant from 1699 tells us that a bingo boy is a great drinker and a bingo club is a set of rakes, lovers of that liquor. And then, bingo, the word became an exclamation. So maybe it makes sense that this exclamation became the name of a game which ends with a loud shout. Bingo! By the 1920s, the game was being played at American fairgrounds using the name Beano, with players putting beans to cover the numbers as they were called out. Supposedly, a toy salesman called Edwin Lowe heard a lady shout out bingo by mistake. He marketed the game with this name, and it stuck. In Britain, bingo developed a language all its own, and that's what I'm off to discover. During the Second World War, this was the only gambling that people in uniform were permitted. So I've come to Dagenham, and tonight I'm going to party like it's 1941. On its own, doctor's orders, number nine. All the twos, two little twos, quack, quack. <laughs> I'm in my 81st year, and I started playing bingo when I joined the Navy. That was when I was 18. Well, there was nothing else to do, especially in Gibraltar during the war. There was no women there, only wrens who were serving in the forces. 43. 43. 45. I heard the reason Bingo Lingo was actually invented was because those old machines took so long, they needed something to fill up time. They actually had to make the number sound longer. Oh, yeah, I, th I do think so, yeah. When they used to say in the Navy, legs 11, unlucky for some, 13. Two and one, royal salute, 21. Royal salute. That's for the guns they fire. Oh, the freeze feathers. Well, they used to say to the cockneys, can you say 33 feathers on a thrush's throat? And the cockneys used to say 33 feathers on a thrush's throat. And that, so they say all the threes feathers.
after the war, bingo with big cash prizes was still not legal. But a small game was a key attraction for that perfect bank holiday. Thousands of people first came across the game in seaside resorts like Bracing Skegness. This was a hugely popular destination for holidaymakers keen to escape the post-war austerity. It had golden sands, the first butlins, and an almost unlimited supply of gammon, probably tinned. And of course it had bingo. In 1960, the Betting and Gaming Act legalised big prize bingo. You could play it all the way to the beach. Right, eyes down, away we go. 77, Sunset Strip. Doctor's orders, number nine. Five and seven, Beans is Beans is 57. Five and nine, the Brighton line. A lot of those bingo phrases are like little keys unlocking a vision of the past. Brighton line, Doctor's orders, a sort of topical commentary of the time, as though if we had bingo lingo now, we'd be saying, 32, done by a speed camera. Of course, everything always sounds more romantic when it's from the past, but did you know that back then, when the bingo caller drew out the number two, he often did it with a cheery cry of, dirty Jew. Oh yes, they were the golden days of boiled cabbage and casual racism. It wasn't exactly the busiest time of year when I went to Skegness. But you can always find keen bingo players. Nip Wright has been working in bingo and entertainment in Skegness for over 60 years. You have to learn them all. Yeah, it, it, it was expected of you. You could, you could not be a bingo call in the early days and not do them. It just wasn't done. The garden gate, that's number eight. The red ball comes out and says, oh, it's legs, gentlemen, it's number 11. And they all used to whistle. It's legs, gentlemen, 11. Thank you. The number comes out, was she worth it? And the answer is, it was seven and six, which was the price of a maize light. And sure enough, somebody had shout out, she was worth every penny. <laughs> Today, everybody knows phrases like two fat ladies or clickety click. But curiously, the lingo has died out altogether from modern halls. Five and three, fifty three. Two and nine, twenty nine. Now the game is played in holy silence. The liturgy contains strictly numbers only. Three and two, thirty-two. Five and nine, fifty-nine. Eight and six, eighty-six. Seven and five, seventy-five. You can even use a computer four to check off your card for you. Nine oh nine ninety. I think it's a real shame that bingo lost its lingo. It just seems a more appealing and complete little world when it has its own special dialect. That's one of the things that language can do, bind a community together with its own codes and slang, which make you feel part of something, a private communication which only like-minded people truly understand, like bingo lingo or poker jargon. But the old guard are right, these modern places are just about greed. It's just bigger prizes, more cash, the relentless giving out of larger and larger sums of money. And if you'll excuse me, I... I think the next session is just starting. All the sixes, 66. Six and four, 64. Seven, six, 76. A burger is a terrible, terrible thing. It's a chopped up mishmash. However popular, burger should be avoided at all costs. <laughs> Hamburger, on the other hand, is fit for any menu. <laughs> the point is, it's not made from ham. It comes from Hamburg, in Germany. It started with the name, the Hamburger Steak. So the word burger is an etymological 
outrage. You might as well claim a Frankfurter was named after a chap called Frank, who furted. The OED have asked for our help with boffin, a word redolent with that combination of amusement and suspicion with which the English view intellectuals. One imagines a man with a large domed head, spectacles, and a mind so full of arcane information that he doesn't know how to buy a bus ticket. I say he advisedly. I remember The Sun once described Carol Vorderman in a remarkable turn of phrase as a curvy egghead. Now there's an image to juggle with, but if she'd been a man, she would have been a boffin. Felipe Fernandez Armesto, a historian who knows about almost everything, went to find out more about the word. I admit it, I get called a boffin. What people mean is that I'm a figure of fun simply because I know lots, in my case, about history. But there's a puzzle here because boffins are no joke at all, according to the dictionary. Boffin, a person engaged in backroom scientific or technical research. I'm going to that island over there on the trail of the first ever boffins. Apparently they were the bee's knees. According to the first recorded mention of the word in the Times in 1945, they were a band of scientific men who worked wartime wonders and apparently called themselves the Boffins. The abandoned military range of Orford Ness off the Suffolk coast. This place is rich in secret history. Perhaps there were boffins here before 1945. These are the huts where the first radar teams worked, and that's important because, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the name boffins was first applied by members of the RAF to scientists working on radar. Radar is still a mystery to most people. Radar gave Britain not just a superior technology, but also a new kind of hero. The inventor. Radar's creator, a charismatic Scottish professor, had assembled his crack team before the war. I had the privilege of gathering around me a team of brilliant and enthusiastic and tireless young men Back in 1936, that growing band of scientists had moved from its humble huts at Orford Ness to the grandeur of nearby Bordsey Manor. Radar experts helped our word hunt by putting me in touch with one of those scientists. Keith Wood, now aged 90, was a member of the top secret team. So what did the word boffin mean to him, and when? The adjutant and the administrative staff would talk to me about the boffins. The boffins always seemed to be these young junior scientific officers, eight or nine of them, and they were all rather flamboyant, all pretty clever, all full of fun. And they were known as the Bordsy boffins. There were people you noticed. And, and the, when was that? January 1936. W was it written down? In, I, as you, I as never you saw it written down. I've seen it written since, yeah. but, but not in those days. Uh, because it would be too informal, a sort of slangy a word amongst yourselves that, to get into right. an office memo or something that's like right. that. That's right. Despite the lack of written proof, I think Keith Wood is a pretty reliable witness. 
So within these very walls, the word boffin was first coined, but we don't know why. There are all sorts of theories. It's the corruption of the, the name of an aircraft, or it's short for back office men. My own favorite theory is that it was based on a cafe in Oxford, which the scientists might have used in their student days. Unless word hunters come forward with clinching evidence, I suppose we'll never know for sure. But what intrigues me even more is, how did the word get out of Bordsy into the outside world? And when it did, how did its meaning change? Victory began the change. After 1945, Radar's creators could be named and celebrated. Radar was a major factor in the victory of the famous few in the Battle of Britain. Result of the inventive genius of 2,400 men the RAF called Boffins. But in Britain, once you are celebrated, you can be satirized. Now here I'm on the track of what I think might be the first film about boffins. I wonder how their image will have changed since those great radar days. What sort of heroes are they going to be portrayed as? Ah, oh, good morning, gentlemen. So these are the bathroom boys, eh? Yes, this is where... A government minister is visiting a wartime research laboratory. Is that another invention of yours? Oh, no, 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 that's an electric calculating machine. It does some, sir. Oh, really, really? Oh, well, we must give it something to do. Uh, divide uh, 5162 by um, 8. That's 645.25, sir. Quite the boffins are clever, yes, but no longer exactly heroic. And uh, then you'll see that by the addition of just one single drop of this liquid, uh, I shouldn't stand quite so close by you, sir, uh, it becomes immediately combustible. Well, that's funny. Oh, well, I expect you'll get it right soon. Well, the minister's even sillier than the boffins, but the boffins are getting a bit silly, too. Their image is becoming not just humorous, but actually ridiculous. Their inventions are ramshackle. Their cleverness is... Irritating. Yes, that would be even better. <laughs> well, it's been most interesting. Thank you. Boffin was gaining an extra meaning, which the OED doesn't yet have. You've really done it this time. You know you're twisting my mind. You got me acting like a waxed out chair. So Today, boffins are stock comedy characters in popular newspapers. It's the word we use for visionaries who come a bit unstuck. That's what always happens to intellectuals in Britain. Show a brain and you get labelled brain box, smart aleck, smarty pants. You can't be passionate about your subject in Britain without mixing in a bit of self-mockery. Now, we historians like to find the origins of our bad habits way back in the past. What happened to the boffins happened at least once before to a group of intellectuals here in 18th century London. It was all down to hosiery. In the 18th century, to be powerful, you had to be fashionable, which meant you had white leggings. But some of the grandest women writers of the day welcomed people of ability even if they turned up in workmen's blue socks. So the wags called the women blue stockings. Nowadays, dumb men use the name blue stocking to disparage clever females. But what did the name mean at the time? The original blue stockings were influential, brilliant, free-thinking. I asked a blue stocking historian how they felt about the name. I think it was very quickly taken up in a positive sense. It may have been slightly ironic at first and playful, um, but it soon became a badge of pride, if you like. It was the novelty of daring to appear at a social occasion not wearing white silk, which was the arist aristocratic norm. So what does an intellectual woman today feel about the term blue stocking? Well, I think today, if you say blue stocking, the connotations aren't very attractive. You think of a solitary scholar, dowdy, intellectual, divorced from reality. There was once affectionate humour in the word blue stocking, just like with boffin. No one minds a bit of irony. 
but is the story of how these words have changed, a reflection of how little we value real talent. Back where the boffins began, I feel we've recounted the history of a danger of how humour degenerates into ridicule and British thinking rusts. Maybe that's why the age of British brilliance, the age of the boffins and the blue stockings is over, and the age of British bleakness is here. Like it or not, the British boffin is not what he used to be. The meanings moved on, and perhaps the dictionary should do the same. I'm just going to put in front of you these copies of The Sun, <laughs> bedrock of English comedy culture, just full of references to boffins in a kind of jokey way. And we were thinking perhaps... Brit boffins. It's time for a new definition. You'll be glad to know we have written a definition for you to save you the trouble. Let me just pass that out. We thought you could put someone who is so clever they are, at least from the point of view of the English, practically bonkers. Good enough? Uh, no, because a bonker could be somebody who bonks. You don't want that really, do you? Surely it's the opposite. Boffins' minds are on higher things. Sorry, it was just reading the sum that put that into my mind. <laughs> Tanya, are we beginning to look at this? Yeah, we have been collecting evidence on this sense. It's a, it's a development we are aware of, and our new census drafting team are at work collecting evidence. It ought to go in, and I'm sure in the fullness of time it will. John, this whole series is about the way the dictionary is coming up to date, still alive and vibrant. Is boffin one of those words that just needs a whole new meaning? Well, it's, it's true that we were actually uh, already working on, on this uh, new sense that you've picked up, which is great. So uh, we've noticed it, you've noticed it. Um, and uh, it, it, we're, we're more or less ready to publish it. The boffins in the dictionary are still... Uh, Doing the, the, making the final changes. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's the sense of the word that we're going to want to include. So that's great. Wonderful. Thank you for the access to your ginormous brains. Well, that's genuinely satisfying. We already got Balti and Back to Square One moved earlier, and now Boffin's going into the dictionary with a whole new sense to it. And so the definitive record of the English language grows that little bit more definitive, thanks to us. Even though this series has come to an end, the word hunt is far from over. There are still plenty of words on the list at bbc.co.uk slash balderdash, which none of us has been able to crack. Maybe you can do it, or maybe you can improve on what we've done in the last six weeks. If so, we want to hear from you. Email us at balderdash at bbc.co.uk and send us your findings. We'll be back with another programme soon to report on what you found. Till then, keep word hunting. Award-winning political satire, the thick of it, next here on BBC Two. And tomorrow at nine, investigating herbalism, alternative medicine.